Hello everyone, my name is Maxime Clemens. I'm a pen tester and a leader of the CSER team of uh, PwC Luxembourg. Um, I already made some talks at Aquilu, so I'm very happy to be there again. But before we start, I just wanted to uh, thank the uh, uh, review committee of uh, the previous uh, Akalu editions because they rejected my first proposition on defeating VPN always on. Um, I needed to work much better on that, and then I ended up uh, presenting this topic at DEF CON this year. So if you needed a, uh, a motivational speech, that's, that's a slide. Uh, if you want to look at what I've done, you can scan this QR code. So all the resources are on the DEF CON media server. I'm not going to do a full replay. There is no point doing that. I prepared some exclusive content for, for today. Um, and the main idea will be to explain what happened since. So I made the presentation at DEF CON and only Palo Alto uh, uh, reached out to, to me. So we could discuss about my findings and they tried to understand it better. The other uh, editors did not, did not contact me. So what I prepared for you today is I'm just going to explain again um, uh, what I've done, how it works, what you can do to um, bypass always on or to improve the, the situation if you can. But for today, I will uh, mostly explain um, the, uh, the, the feedback from Palo Alto on what I could find again after my rechecks. So who is this talk for? Uh, obviously for red teams, if you encounter um, an organization that has VPN with always on enabled, then you can find some ways to bypass it. And I'm going to show uh, a few examples there. For the blue team, of course, uh, you will be aware of these shortcomings of the VPN agents, and maybe you will find a way to improve the, the situation. One key thing to keep in mind is I did not want to use weird techniques, uh, slow techniques with QR codes or any kind of other uh, exfiltration uh, methods. I want to have something super reliable, super fast, and I don't want to be uh, to need admin privileges. Um, I will take two scenarios, two main scenarios where we are not admin of the machine, where I am a, an um, a insider, or if I don't have even a physical access to the, to the device that I want to attack. So I want to use only things without privileges. I think I don't need to explain what uh, the VPN, what is the advantage of a VPN when you have a workforce that is uh, outside of the LAN. Of course, when you have the VPN always on, they are forced to go through the corporate controls that, that we want. Um, the always on or lockdown mount that I'm going to, to speak about prevents any LAN access. Um, you are forced to connect to the VPN. For this review, I selected these three editors, three providers. Uh, just keep in mind that any other editors uh, probably work the same and you can find the same kind of issues with other uh, providers. The symptoms of uh, VPN always on when the tunnel is not established. Uh, this is my scope. I just want to work when the tunnel is not established. Uh, if it is established, then you will have to find um, other techniques that exist, but that's uh, out of scope. So as you can see there, the idea is that if the tunnel is not established, then you are uh, forced to uh, uh, connect to the tunnel to authenticate and so on. Otherwise, you get this weird general failure, uh, which is kind of a, a, a typical symptom of that. But we don't want this to happen. We need some connectivity, and we can find some ways to get it back. So let's have a look at the scenarios. As I explained, uh, we can either, either be uh, right in the middle and we are attacking a target, a device uh, that we don't have direct access to, or we can be considered as an insider and then not only we will have the possibility to execute commands and to do things on the device itself, but we can control the network as well. Again, um, I'm placed in a situation where the, there are a lot of controls already. If I can simply put a USB key on the, on the laptop, then that's, uh, that's not what I want to do. I'm, I'm considering only uh, high security scenarios where you have everything, every hardening control deployed. You are not admin. You have uh, blocked USB Bluetooth on everything else. And basically the only thing that we can use uh, is, is network. 
And again, I don't want to use uh, uh, weird exotic exfiltration methods. I want something to be, uh, I want the technique to be reliable uh, and fast. Um, again, two main concepts to, to know uh, when it comes to bypassing always on. We need to, uh, we need to understand two things. The first is the trusted network detection. It is the algorithm that has been implemented in the VPN agents to know if it is on the LAN or not. If it is on the LAN, then there is no need to connect to the VPN gateway, of course. But if it is not, then uh, it will force, uh, it will block, block all connectivity until it can establish the tunnel. The other um, concept is captive portal detection. So you know that sometimes when you are in the hotel, in the uh, airport, you maybe need to authenticate first on a web page. Maybe you have to pay for that and so on. Uh, and this is something that will uh, be a kind of compromise uh, from the VPN agent to let you connect at least to this uh, captive portal before it can reach uh, the um, gateway. One of the most important slides all the settings on the logs are uh, user accessible. So if you are an insider, you will find almost all the settings, all the values that you need, you will find them at these locations. So you have um, um, settings, uh, sometimes in files, sometimes in registries, uh, and you also have logs. And if you combine both information, you will probably get everything you need. And I'm not going to speak about um, split tunneling opportunities, but maybe if you look at the uh, values there on the exceptions, maybe you will, need, you will find everything you need uh, without bypassing um, actually the, the VPN always on uh, feature. Um, quick explanation on captive portal detection. These are algorithms that are um, um, implemented by the main OSs. So you can see it's basically uh, consisting of uh, a request to web server on if the check fails. So if they don't find what they need, uh, we can consider that it's, uh, uh, there is a captive portal. So this is something that we can trick because we can. If we control the network, we can uh, probably try to find some ways to make the device on the VPN agent to believe there is a captive portal on the network. So just looking at these simple concepts, so uh, CPD, TND on the um, actual values that we can find on the device, we can already think about naive attacks because we don't need to understand how the uh, um, uh, network blocking is working. We already found some ways to, to probably bypass that. The first one that I imagine is the fact that in any case, the laptop, the device must uh, 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 find what is the IP address of the, um, uh, of the gateway. So a DNS must work in any case. But the fact that DNS must work does not mean that maybe we can't try to use uh, UDP 53 as a whole. So we don't need to comply with the uh, DNS protocol and then we will benefit from the whole uh, um, uh, bytes that we can um, use to establish this kind of thing. And it works. Uh, let's just take these very simple PowerShell lines. You can establish a tunnel uh, through uh, UDP, but it does not work for all agents. So we can f we, we already found some discrepancies between the VPN agents. It works for Cisco and Palo Alto, but uh, using UDP 53 uh, does not work for Eventy. We will figure it out later. On the same, you could think that maybe DHCP could be another uh, port that we can use, um, and it does not work all, the, all of the time. And here I put Eratum because this is something that I rechecked after my DEFCON presentation, and I found other observations that I'm going to share. So that was the first attack that could work depending on your setup. Um, again, another naive attack, we can pretend we are a captive portal, and for that it's quite easy. You just have to redirect some of the flows uh, to trick the agents to believe there is a captive portal. And again, if I can pretend I am a captive portal, I have a web server that is running, and I can benefit from all the features uh, that I can have with any HTTP server. So you can exfiltrate information, uh, you can establish a bidirectional C2, uh, you can do almost whatever you want. Um, depending on the agent, the software that you use, you can have either uh, a few minutes, sometimes you can configure that on uh, Palo Alto, 
told me that uh, it's disabled by default, and it is that in the uh, in the doc documentation. Uh, it's just a coincidence that I found it uh, the same value for some uh, some clients, but by default it is disabled. When it is when it is enabled, that's the only way for uh, uh, someone to be able to authenticate on the network and to get some internet connectivity. So you can use that to exfiltrate information on to uh, to send big files. Um, maybe my favorite attack is when the trusted network detection is vulnerable because the way it works, the way it's implemented, most of the time it's just based on values that are going on the network and that you can uh, impersonate. So there is no, there is no check uh, on the authenticity of these ones. If you can simply say that you have this DNS suffix you share with your um, uh, DHCP server, you give these values, then you might pretend you are the trusted network again. Um, that will work, uh, and that will be uh, uh, super convenient because then you unlock all the local connectivity and you will be able to do whatever you want. Um, just to remark there, uh, AnyConnect and uh, Global Protect from Palo Alto, uh, they had some updates, so you can configure that with a much better check, uh, which will um, verify the presence of one server having one uh, uh, I would specific um, certificate hash. So it's, uh, it's a, a good way to bypass this kind of um, attack. But let's just give an example on how you can actually attack that. I'm just going to give the example of uh, Eventy there. You can find on the top right, we have the content of the settings file. And you will see that you just need to reverse this Boolean logic because if you need to pretend that you are on the uh, LAN of the company or the organization, you just have to configure uh, a DNS mask, for instance, or any DHCP server to serve and to tell the device that all the values that are expected are there. And when you do that, then uh, the VPN agent will consider it is on the LAN and it will be, uh, uh, you do not need anything else uh, to pretend you are on the LAN and to unlock completely unlock the connectivity of, um, of the, the, the device. Uh, just a few words with um, um, Palo Alto. Indeed, when it is uh, not configured with what they call the advanced internal host detection, that's the same. You can find the values that are expected not in the settings, because they are encrypted. You can find them in the logs. Um, so again, it's very easy to find on when you prepare your DHCP values with what is expected, uh, Palo Alto will consider that it's indeed on the LAN when it's not configured with the uh, uh, advanced internal host detection. So we could find some naive attacks already. We don't even need to understand how it works uh, behind the scene. But again, some questions remain. We have some discrepancies between the agents, between the software uh, editors, so maybe we need to uh, find how, how that works. Well, behind the scene is the Windows filtering platform. Um, it's well documented by Microsoft and well documented by other researchers. Uh, I'm just giving a few concepts there. You have some provider that can uh, commit filters to the uh, network or to the kernel of Windows, to keep it simple. Uh, you have some layers, sub-layers, and then you have the famous filters that you need to understand if you want to uh, uh, find a way to bypass them. And then we have some API uh, functions that we can call and that you can even reuse yourself. If you want to inspect the WFP filters, you have several tools that exist. The first one is actually integrated in Windows. You already have it, so NetSH WFP. And you can dump the whole list of filters that are committed on active on the, um, uh, on the device. When you do that, you get a file like this. You get a nice um, XML output uh, that you can easily interpret. You have there an example with the name of the uh, um, display data. Then we have the auth connect uh, layer. So it means that it will be for everything that will use uh, um, TCP uh, outbound. And then we have the action, action block and uh, we have the uh, weight of this filter. So just with, with this one, it's actually the um, last filter that is going to be applied, and it is one of the examples to implement always on, because everything will be blocked uh, outgoing with, with this kind of rule. And you can use other tools that are a bit maybe more convenient, um, on, for instance, uh, WFP Explorer, which is one of my favorite because it's a nice graphical interface, and you will also be able to uh, do a, a, a right-click and delete 
the filter. So if you have admin rights, you can play with the rules on how they are uh, uh, pushed in the, uh, in the network stack of, of Windows. If we inspect the filters, we will find that uh, uh, we get almost all the answers. All the filters, all the things that uh, make the agent work, make DHCP DNS work, uh, on everything, everything else that will block the connectivity uh, will be uh, uh, deduced from the filters that you can see. All but Cisco. And because I'm lucky, I started by analyzing Cisco and I had a, quite a hard time because Cisco decided to hide uh, the filters. None of the filters that I knew were there uh, would show up in the uh, WFP output on all the tools. And uh, I knew they were there first because uh, the, the connectivity did not work, but then if you enable the non-default um, uh, subcategories on categories of the uh, uh, audit policy of Windows, you will get the event logs showing that some filters are committed. And if I'm using uh, all the PowerShell uh, uh, scriptlets, I can try to get access to a filter that I know is there, um, and again, I get an access denied. So uh, that's what Cisco tried to do. They put some ACL on the filters so that even system cannot read what are the filters that were committed. Um, so for that, uh, to investigate that, I wrote some uh, free data scripts that I released on the DevCon server if, if you need to play with it uh, like, like I've done. Uh, now, by intercepting the calls to the filter adding functions, um, we can find that there is a security descriptor that is optional, but Cisco decided to implement something like that. Um, you see there that with Frida again, I dumped the actual uh, uh, parameters to the function, and when we interpret that, thanks to uh, other PowerShell commandlets, um, mostly from James Forshaw, we can then have our answer. We see that for the system user, we do not have any read access to the filters that are committed by, by Cisco AnyConnect. We only have write and delete. If we need to read the filters, we need to have a, a local service account, and this is what we get there. So they changed the ACL so that you, the filters were kind of hidden. But now that we get the value that is expected, it's kind of easy. And for that, I was, easy, I was lucky to uh, um, um, discuss with James Forshaw, uh, who gave me some tricks on, thanks to his tool again, uh, just by precising on forging a token that is expected, then we can list the filter. So if I'm not using the token, I get an empty list of all the filters that were pushed by any connect. But if I'm presiding the token that is expected, then I get the list of all the filters. So sometimes uh, you can, um, you, you, you might need to find what is the expected uh, uh, token that you need or the expected privileges that you need to inspect uh, uh, that. So thanks to the investigation in all the filters that you can have. So Cisco was kind of a, a weird and hard case, but for Eventy on Palo Alto, it's super easy. You can find all the filters on how they are implemented. And thanks to this uh, analysis, we can now conclude on why it was not possible to use uh, um, um, the uh, ideas that we had for some clients. And the first one is we could not use UDP 67 for DHCP. Um, well, that's because in the filters, most of the time, they will precise the uh, source port that you need to have. And if you do not have local privileges, you will not be allowed to force the source port of, of your connection. So it will not work. Um, TCP on uh, TCP DNS could also be used, but again, if we look at the filters that are pushed to the network stack, we cannot use uh, the 53 port uh, if it is on TCP. And again, this is something that I rechecked, and I have another conclusion for Palo Alto now. Uh, again, can't use DNS tunnel with Eventy. It's because Eventy had the specific rules uh, that will only allow the system process to use UDP 53. So we can uh, get the explanations to the uh, discrepancies there. Now, uh, Palo Alto reacted, and they say, no, that's, that's not true. We do not have any issues with unrestricted UDP ports. So uh, uh, I wanted to uh, um, investigate that a bit. And what we have there is a very nice example of rule shadowing. So on the left, we have the rules that I found there most often. So you can see we have a permit rule from uh, Global Protect. It's to uh, outbound 
um, um, UDP or TCP, so just outbound, it has a weight. And in the conditions, we have UDP, remote port 67, and source port uh, 68. So this is the kind of rule that will prevent you from using uh, UDP 67 if you want to exfiltrate through, through UDP, for instance. But sometimes, on, um, I, I'm not done investigating why they do that, but sometimes they pushed another rule, and you will see that it's again a permit, it's always, it's again auth connect, and the weight is uh, um, lower, so it has a higher priority, and then you will see that the conditions are just UDP and port 67. So this rule is, uh, is, is, um, uh, will be applied in priority compared to that one. Uh, it's a nice example of uh, uh, firewall rule shadowing. On when this rule is committed, then uh, we will be authorized to use um, UDP 67. So again, I think it's a kind of an implementation issue that they might fix. Conclusion, again, I, I have even less time than for the DEFCON presentations. This is the table of all the attacks that I found on that works uh, for these various clients. And you can see that um, they do not behave in the same way at all, but you can always find at least one technique that will work for the client that you have. Um, and again, it will also depend on the version of your VPN agent because I noticed some discrepancies, improvement, and sometimes uh, uh, regression between between versions. So if I take the V607, um, I found that you can even use UDP67 sometimes for some reason, but you can also use TCP53. Uh, it will be authorized in the latest uh, version. Now, after the talk um, from from uh, uh, at Las Vegas, I got contacted by Palo Alto. They wanted to discuss. Uh, I think it was it was a, a nice discussion with them. Um, first, they told me, "Oh, you were wrong. Captive portal detection is disabled by default." That's true, indeed. Um, so I wanted to to uh, to uh, fix that. Um, advanced internal host detection. Again, it is something that I could not test in practice because I did not want to share the uh, latest V61. I think now we are V62, but uh, the uh, V61 they did not want to share it with me, so I could not test it in practice. Apparently, in the documentation, the way it is written, I think it will fix the trusted network, the trusted network detection issue. And then we have. Uh, we had more uh, uh, back and forth exchanges on the unrestricted UDP ports. They said it's not vulnerable. I said yes. They said no. I said yes. And then they realized that yes, I was right. Uh, but then that's not a big deal because the channel that, is, that can be established is not bidirectional. Uh, well, unfortunately, or fortunately, WFP is stateful. So if you get some packets that get authorized to get out, then uh, the answers will be will be authorized as well. So it can definitely be bidirectional. So if you want to establish a C2 only with those UDP ports, it will, it will work. Um, and finally, they say that, okay, it's not a vulnerability, it's a feature evasion. Why not? Uh, and it will be addressed uh, nonetheless. Okay, recommendations. Again, I have limited times on, uh, they are boring. So just have a look at the DEFCON content. You will see what I propose. It's not easy at all. Um, the, uh, conclusion, the takeaways is that the VPN agents, they are not perfect. All of them have some issues. It's not the same issues for all. They, we have some discrepancies, but none of them is perfect. Um, again, naive attack works. We could find some techniques that work, even if we do not know anything about Windows filtering platform or, or any, anything else. And we do not need to reverse uh, uh, the binaries to find some attacks that work. Uh, TND spoofing uh, remains my favorite attack because it's the most convenient, but provided that you do not have a, ver a very um, hardened configuration with the latest versions of the VPN agents. Uh, again, all the answers, all the values uh, can be easy to find either with uh, WFP tooling or even by reading the documentation uh, uh, from, the, from the tools. And we can also find some nice open source tools that will help you understand everything about uh, Windows filtering platform on how it is implemented by this. Uh, on, again, since I've been doing a lot of pen tests on these solutions, I can say that in addition to the issues from the vendors themselves on the agents, uh, we can also find some mistakes uh, that will uh, um, undermine the overall security model of all OSN if you let users having uh, a right access to the configuration files, for instance, just, just an example. 
Um, all right. If you want to follow up on this uh, work, I will give my final talk at uh, Black Alps uh, in a few weeks. On you will find new specific bypass techniques that are specific to um, uh, some providers. I found some fun attacks as well, and then we will discuss more about the tools. And I think I'm on time. Thank you very much for your attention.